Good morning Jubilee, good to be with you. Unusual times these, but here we are, still in lockdown. I miss you guys, miss seeing you, we'd love to be there in the flesh, I'm sure we all would. Who would have ever thought that we would go through a time when we couldn't meet as the people of God together? But hey, we've been a few weeks now, and though it's tough, I believe we will come through this. A wonderful man of God many years ago used to preach on the verse, it came to pass. I know this is a tricky time. It will come to pass. We will come through this. I believe that. I believe God will bring us through it. I believe we'll be okay. There's some real painful times. There's some challenging times we've all seen on the news. But we trust God even in the midst of the trial, don't we? And I'm going to follow on this morning a little bit in Acts 23. And follow on from what Dave was saying last week in Acts 22. and The story of Paul with... He's actually in a bit of a lockdown himself, isn't he? Um, he's been in Jerusalem uh, preaching the grace of God and has found himself being detained and contained. And the title of this preach is Finding Hope in Challenging Times. And these are certainly challenging times for all of us. I don't know where you find yourself today when you're watching this message. Maybe it's employment stuff that is really difficult. I know jobs are on the line. I know that economic things are difficult. Maybe you find yourself on your own completely. And I want to encourage you that you are not on your own, that Jesus is with you in that house, in that flat. He's with you this morning by his Holy Spirit. And before I start, I'd just like to pray. Uh, pray for all of you. Lord Jesus, thank you for being with us in this time. Thank you that... You're sovereign over all things, that you are the king of the ages. There's nothing that is beyond you or out of your control. Thank you that you see the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. You are the Alpha and the Omega. And I pray that as we look into your word this morning, that you will encourage us, that you will challenge us. And that, Lord, we'll find great solace in you. But, Lord, you will change us as well. We are those who are being changed from glory to glory. Father, thank you that in the Christian life we are called to grow and to move on in you. So I pray that today you will do a new work in each and every one of us. Even as I read these words, I pray, Lord, you will change me, challenge me. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, you're with us. Uh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for our salvation. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So in these words, from Acts chapter 22 into 23, we read about Paul, who's almost been flogged by the Romans. He's been detained. And then he pulls out that wonderful trump card, doesn't he? He said, hey guys, I'm a Roman citizen. You can't really do this to me. And as a result, the commander panics. I think his name's Ly um, Claudius Lysias. He panics and says, oh, right, okay. We better put you through, through the Jewish court. So Paul ends up in front of the Sanhedrin. Now he will be very familiar with the Sanhedrin because prior to his conversion, Paul, remember, was Saul. Um, and he was a zealot Jew. He was going out trying to destroy the church of Jesus Christ at the time. And even on the trip to Jerusalem, when he had his conversion experience, he was taking letters there to destroy the way, as it was called, that was what the church, the Christians were called in those times, the way. He was on his way to, on his way to destroy the way. When Jesus appeared to him on that road to Damascus, turned his life upside down, called him into the ministry, and again, he changed from being a, a zealous a, a opponent of the gospel, almost like a mercenary uh, for Israel, looking to destroy this new sect, as it was called. And he changed, he was converted, and went from being that to a wonderful apostle of faith, a wonderful apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave us majority of our New Testament epistles. So we pick the story up um, in the end of chapter 22, when basically Paul is put before this, this court, this high court, the Sanhedrin, made up of Pharisee, and Sadducee, who were religious leaders. And of course, it's presided over by a high priest. And this high priest is 
of the name Ananias. Now that's not the Ananias we read about in Paul's conversion. This guy wasn't a very nice guy. He was the high priest at the time. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, calls him a hoarder of money. He was all about corruption. He was all about bullying priests in the temple to get their money. He wasn't a nice piece of work at all. And then in the early part of the chapter 23, if you look down, he, Paul stands before Ananias. And there's this altercation goes on. It would appear that Paul didn't recognize the high priest. Why that was, I don't know. But Paul is struck in the face and he challenges the high priest. And then he drops in this spanner in the works in the Sanhedrin about the resurrection of the dead. Now, that's a very interesting line because the Sanhedrin was made up of Sadducee and Pharisee, two religious groups. And you, in those days, the Sadducees were the more conservative. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't really believe in an afterlife. They believed very much in a moral code, a moral life, keeping to the Ten Commandments, living as a good Jew. Whereas the Pharisees did believe in a, in, a, in a supernatural life. Though they hadn't accepted the gospel, they believed that there was a supernatural world. They believed in an afterlife. Um, so then a huge debate took place, which became quite violent, the Bible says. And if you read in that, those few verses up until verse 11, you read how Paul is in the middle of this debate. And it became so violent that they decided to take him out of there because they were they feared that he would be torn to pieces. The commander, this Roman commander, gets Paul out of there and basically confines him into the barracks. So Paul found himself confined into a Roman barracks. And the key verse I'd like to pull out of this whole chapter for us today in this lockdown time is verse 11. It says, the following night, the Lord Jesus, so it says the Lord, it's clearly Jesus, stood near Paul and said to him, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. What a wonderful little verse. God said to Paul, in that barracks, in that place of confinement, take courage. And that's a thought I'd really like to leave with you this morning. Take courage, whatever situation you find yourself in. God is with you. He'd given Paul a specific word there, hadn't he? He said, you will go to Rome. So Paul knew at that point that whatever was going to happen to him in Jerusalem, he was safe in God. That takes faith. It takes faith to trust in God's word in times of challenge and times of persecution and times of real uncertainty. And Paul was a man of faith, wasn't he? He was a man who learned to trust God. He was so caught up with the gospel. Do you remember in the Philippian jail? He was, he'd been beaten severely with Silas. And it says at midnight, they were in the stocks and they began to sing praise to God. And all the prisoners began to listen and hear. And they were tough circumstances. Yet Paul knew his God. And he began to praise him in a prison cell, in the darkest place, in the confined dungeon of that situation, he found time and a place to praise God and take courage. He knew his life was held in God's hand. I love the story in the Old Testament of when David is on the run from Saul and in one encounter he meets a lady called Abigail. And she prophesies over David and says, your life is safe in the bundle of the living. And whatever we go through right now in life, whatever situation we face, we have to keep hold of the fact that God has got our lives. If you're a Christian, you're secure in God. He's already conquered death. He's conquered sin. He's conquered the grave. And he's given us a life now to live, an eternal life full of purpose and promise. And we can take great courage. The word here, courage, uh, in the Greek means take, take heart. Be daring, almost. Do you remember when people used to dare you to do things? Jesus said, be daring. Be strong. As you've testified about me here, you're going to go to Rome. Interested now, in the next few verses, if you look down at your Bible, verse 12, it talks about a plot that emerges. <clears throat> and the very next day, 
very next morning. It's interesting, whenever God speaks, the enemy tries to ambush the word. And in this situation, it was literally an ambush he planned. And he planned, or some Jews planned, that when Paul was taken from the barracks to the Sanhedrin again, that they took a, 40 of them took a, a vow not to eat until Paul was dead. And they made a plan to ambush that entourage that would have taken him there and killed Paul before he even got to the Sanhedrin. So it just so happens in the goodness of God that Paul's nephew, I wonder who he was, he's not mentioned by name, but it says in verse 16, that when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. So he got a, through, a message through to Paul that there was a plot to kill him. As rules of this, Paul then speaks to a centurion and says, take this young man to the commander. And in the grace of God, this young guy, Paul would have been quite an influential man, I would think. But this nephew is taken to the commander. And the commander basically hears of the plot. And he then changes things around completely. He gets two uh, of his centurions. They were in charge of 100 men, each centurion. And some um, 200 soldiers, detached with 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at night. So Paul's gone from being in the Sanhedrin, nearly torn apart, to in the barracks, and now he's in the centre of an entourage that's fit for a king to go to the next part of his trial in Caesarea. So this plot, this, this plot is foiled, and all really in God's purposes. Paul was going to get to Caesarea, he was going to get on to Rome, he was going to get there because God had already spoken. And for us, in these times, whatever situations we are facing, be it sickness, be it your health, be it finance, be it job, I want to encourage you to take courage. And courage is very um, akin to hope, isn't it? The word hope. Well, the word hope for the Christian is a wonderful word. It's not the word that the natural man has. I hope the sun comes out today. I hope that we can have a barbecue at the weekend. I hope, which is based on maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. But biblical hope is far different. It comes from a Greek word of elpis, which basically means real security in a favourable outcome. Even that in itself is a wonderful picture we believe that God has got all things in hand. We have happy anticipation that God ultimately will bring us to himself. He will, in Ephesians, we find out he will bring all things together under one head, even Christ. So the whole of life, the whole of circumstances, the whole of situation, the whole of heaven and the whole of earth are going to be united under one man, even Christ. Wow, what a promise. What a hope we have. We know that our sins, if we are Christians, have been forgiven forever. We know that we have a new nature. We have the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 is a wonderful chapter and I encourage you to read it. It tells you about you being a new creation. It tells you that you have God's righteousness. He has given you that as a free gift. That is a tremendous hope. And whatever situation we go through, we know... God has conquered death, he's conquered sin and one day when this earthly pilgrimage comes to an end we'll be with him forever. I want to encourage you today to take courage to have wonderful hope and as I was thinking of this word hope I sense a, God gave me a mnemonic for us to remember it by Mnemonic is to take the letters of the word and give them some meaning. So if you think of the word hope, the first letter is the word H. And are you hungry for God? Are you hearing God in this time of lockdown? The Bible says, doesn't it, Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness 
will be filled. So I want to say to you, first letter of the word hope, what's your appetite like? What's your hunger like? Second H, if you like, is are you hearing God? Wonderful promise. Let me read you this wonderful promise from Isaiah 55. It says, give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. Now, as you read your Bible, look for Jesus on every page. He's there in Isaiah 55. Give ear to me that, and hear me that your soul may live. Your soul has been transformed. Remember David said in Psalm 23, he restored my soul. As a Christian, your soul, you've been made right. But we are growing every day. Our soul is being restored. Your soul is your will, your emotions, your decision-making facilities. They are being restored. Give ear. Let your soul live. God's promised his faithful love to David. And that was found in reality in the Lord Jesus Christ, wasn't it? He was great David's greater son. So I challenge you, are you hungry for God? Get to hear him. Get to spend time in his presence. Listen for him. So often I, I, I can pray and talk to God, but not always am I very good at listening. And I want to be a better listener to God. So hear him. Give ear that your soul may live. So the first letter, H. Have a hunger for God, but hear God as well. So the O in the word, hope. Overcomer, I want to remind you today, even in these circumstances that are very difficult, the Bible always says you are an overcomer. Romans 8 is a wonderful chapter. When I was at Bible college, we had to learn it off by heart and stand in front of our principal without a Bible and recite the whole chapter. And I've been revisiting that scripture memorization while we've been in lockdown. And I've been learning Romans 8 again. I won't do it now. But there's a wonderful end part of that chapter that says, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. You are more than a conqueror. In these situations, God promises to take us through. He, come, he promises to be with us in every situation. So he's going to be with us through this. In Revelation, we read those wonderful words in chapter 12, saying of the saints, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. You know, Jesus' blood has covered everything. It's covered our sin. It's covered our future. It's covered our past. It's the blood of Jesus that has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And his blood is by what with that which we overcome. It says we over, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, and the word of their testimony. When you begin to speak and then to remember all the things that the Lord's done for you, his faithfulness over many years, I want to encourage you, remind yourself, remind yourself that you're an overcomer. Remind yourself of the promises. Remind you, yourself of the faithfulness. Maybe you're a new Christian, or maybe you've been a Christian for many years. Trace the rainbow through the rain in your life. See how he's always brought you through. He's brought you right through to this place today. And he'll never leave you or forsake you. The P of hope. An old-fashioned Christian word I've been thinking about in the last few days is the word providence. Providence. Wonderful word. And it actually see, means to see before. And God sees a need before we even do. You see how in that situation with Paul, how he spoke to Paul in the barracks. And then, despite this plot, God put his nephew in there to hear about the plot. God always provides for us. And all the way through scriptures, we have wonderful promises. That's another P, isn't it? Promises of providence. And I'd like to tell you a really quick story. I'm running out of time. But in Ormskirk, near where I live, my dad was filled with the Holy Spirit through a, a wonderful old Pentecostal preacher called Eric Oldfield. And Eric had been, before he was a Christian, a notorious man in the town of Ormskirk. He'd been a bit of a drunkard very well known for his not-so-good behaviour, and came to Christ and was wonderfully used to see many people come through into the things of the Holy Spirit. And one day, when Eric and his wife came home, they lived in an old cottage and they lived there for many years, and over the lintel of their door, they noticed one day, they'd never seen it before, they'd lived there for many years, they were now Christians, and over the lintel of the door were these words etched into the stone, 
his providence, our inheritance. I want to say to you that the whole of heaven is it is with you. Our inheritance, our inheritance has been provided by the Lord Jesus. His providence is our inheritance. He promises to look after us. He promises to take through. Think of that wonderful passage in 2 Peter chapter 1. That his divine power has given us all we need for life and godliness and how we get to participate in the divine nature and all about the precious promises that he's given us. I want to remind you, revisit the promises of God on your life. Revisit some of those words that God's given you maybe many years ago that haven't come to fruition yet but were very significant. Remind yourself of those things. Finally, the E. E of hope. And I want to encourage you to have an expectation of enlargement. When we, when we come out of this, things are never going to be the same. But you know, even in the time of lockdown, the gospel has not been locked up. And many people have come to Christ through watching online preachers. They've been seeking out the Bible. Apparently, Eden, who was one of the Christian publishing companies, Bible sales have gone up by 50% in the lockdown. People are seeking, searching on Google for the meaning of life. And we are going to have a wonderful opportunity when we come out of lockdown. It's going to be a time for the church to seize the day for the gospel. And I want to remind you of those wonderful verses in Isaiah 54. Enlarge the place of your tent. So rather than see this as confinement and it's going to go on forever, see this as a time to find God afresh have an expectation of enlargement in terms of influence the gospel, in terms of what the church is really about and I'm believing God and praying for an end time revival and I believe that all things in all things God works together for the, goes who, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his wonderful purpose so I want to encourage you today to have hope in challenging times. Remember how God spoke to Paul in that barracks, told him to take courage, and I say to you today, take great courage, he's with you. He'll take you through, he'll take us all through to one day seeing him face to face, and we will be in eternity with Jesus forever. It's going to be wonderful, but until then, there's a great job to do, and a great purpose to fulfill. So take great courage, even in these challenging times. Bless you.